Hello and welcome to the fourth video in the series that looks at the important media communications theories that try to explain how the media influences people. This video specifically looks at the agenda setting function theory which rose in prominence in the 1970s and key figures in this theory were McCombs and Shaw. So the agenda setting function theory sits slightly to the left of the centre in our scale where it says that the media does have some power. It doesn't have as much power as um, the hypodermic needle theory but it certainly suggests that the media has more power than those suggested in uses and gratification theory or reinforcement theory. So the main definition for this theory is that it suggests that the media doesn't tell audiences what to think, but rather it sets the agenda for what audiences should think about. So if we think about the bullet theory, told audiences what they should be thinking, okay? Whereas uh, the agenda setting function theory, it just suggests that audience should think about a certain topic, whether they sit on one side of the argument or the other is up to the audience. Uh, revisions of this theory also suggest that the media may encourage the audience how to think about an issue. Through the use of codes and conventions, it can attempt to persuade an audience to think one way or the other. But mainly it's about telling audiences what they should think about. In this regard, the media does hold some power in terms that they can set the agenda for um, the public issues of the time. Audiences um, are active. However, they're only active within the limitations of the agendas set by the media. So you can think whatever you want, but you need to think about these certain topics that the media are covering. So a bit of history, the agenda setting function theory uh, was first created in 1972 by McCombs and Shaw. Together they found a correlation, which means an influential relationship uh, between how often and to what extent the media covered a news story and the degree to which the public perceived this issue to be important. So their research centered around news reports uh, during a recent presidential election. And as such, they, the focus was on the kind of influence in terms of news media, in shaping people's perceptions about that election. So they suggested that our influential gatekeepers in the media um, use selection, omission and framing to decide what issues will be presented and how or from which angle they will be presented. So whether they lean towards favouring one politician or the other. This encourages the public to believe an issue is important, which in turn shapes political policies. When McCombs and Shaw talk about gatekeepers, they really are talking about um, particularly influential figures in the media. If we think back to our Year 11 studies of media ownership, people like Rupert Murdoch, who own quite a lot of media, they would be considered a really influential gatekeeper. So key things to look at, and again you might remember some of these terms from Year 11, uh, where selection is um, when an influential media maker decides what they should include in a media broadcast. Uh, omission is when an influential media maker decides what to exclude, what to keep out of a uh, media broadcast. Two new terms here to learn are priming. This is where um, the amount of time and space allocated to an issue or whether it's covered at all. This sets the stage for audience to understand just how important the issue is. A really easy way to think about this is to think about a newspaper 
and where in the paper a story will appear. If it's the only story on the front page of the newspaper, the audience is primed to understand that that is the most important issue of the day. Whereas if it appears in just uh, one eighth corner on page 52 of the newspaper, we can safely assume that the audience will understand that to be less of an important issue. Another key term here is framing, and this is where the media um, emphasizes certain points and downplays others in a news story. An example of this might be a news report that uses the words uh, anti-abortion protesters, or an alternative news report that uses the words pro-life campaigners to create either a positive or a negative connotation for the audience. So that's framing, and if they used one of these terms over another, um, it does aim to influence audience perception of that particular group of people who might be protesting. So the model that we use for the agenda set setting function theory um, is probably the most complicated model that we have, but I will also run through a more simplified version. So at the start of the model, you have reality, okay? Um, now, where reality comes into the media is gatekeepers and influential people within the media um, sift through that reality and then churn out um, what they believe is to be important. And so then they create the media agenda. So this is what we see in news broadcasts. This is what we read in newspapers. Uh, so the media agenda is what is um, delivered from the gatekeepers and influential media figures sifting through reality. The media agenda then has an influence on the public agenda. So what's in the media then gets talked about in the public. So public agenda examples of this could be things like uh, protests, um, where the public has a say and then that can be influential on an audience's perception. Finally, the media agenda and public agenda also have an influence on what's called policy agenda. Think of this in terms of politics. Uh, so politicians will be forced to talk about the things that have been presented in both the public agenda and the media agenda. Now, where it gets even more complicated is sometimes politicians who talk about things then influence what the media talks about. It can be a little bit um, cyclical in this regard. Um, similarly, when politicians talk about something and um, it makes the public angry, then it influences the public agenda and so on. And there's a constant loop happening here. So what does this happen to the audience? Well, their perception of reality is influenced by all of these things combined and how they see them, okay? Um, it's not only, um, their perception of reality is not only influenced by the media, but what they see in terms of protests and also what they hear in terms of what politicians say. However, like we learnt from uh, reinforcement theory, uh, the audience doesn't just get their information from these sources alone, the audience lives in reality and so then therefore reality also has an influence on audience perception. So I told you it was a complicated model and indeed it is, but if you think about a more um, simplified version, if we take, so reality has an influence on the audience, Reality has an influence on representations of reality in the media, and then those representations have an influence on the audience, okay? So we can group these three things together. So we have just one, two, three factors that influence one another. Um, Justin Lewis has a really good uh, video and explanation on um, agenda setting function and politics, um, particularly United States politics. Um, pay close attention to the 2 minute 45 mark where um, Justin talks about 
how um, public perception uh, in terms of the severity of global warming and the severity of the drug problem in America corresponded exactly to how um, the media actually covered that um, issue. So how often the media um, reported on this thing. Um, I'm not going to play Justin's video in um, this video here, but I will include the link in the comments below and encourage you to have a watch um, because it does really sum up um, a really good example of a gender setting function. The original evidence that um, McCombs and Shaw used um, was again in relation to a United States um, presidential election. You'll remember that um, a similar um, election was used to support the reinforcement theory. Um, but McCombs and Shaw um, in 1968 interviewed 100 voters from Chapel Hill, um, which was just a, a, a district of voting. Um, and they analysed the frequency of issues appearing in the news in that local area. So this included um, any 45 seconds or more um, of a television news story or if a news story appeared in the first three stories of a news bulletin, they considered that to be um, you know, a, an important issue to the media. Likewise, in newspapers, any story that appeared on the front page or had at least a three-column headline, so quite a large headline, that's about half a page in a newspaper, um, they considered that to be an important media issue. So then comparing how often the media actually, um, or how often the story appeared prominently in the media, and how voters who were interviewed saw important issues, they actually found that there was um, a correlation or a mutual relationship between the number of times a political issue appeared in the media and the perception by the audience that this issue was important. So there was a really clear relationship where um, something was reported more, more people saw that as an important issue. If it was reported less, then audience perception was that it wasn't as an important issue. So think about testing this theory yourself. Just have a think about uh, news events from the last week and think of the three biggest issues um, that you perceive as happening in this past week. Write them down and then go and see how these were reported, um, not just in local papers, but look at the media that you were actually exposed to this week, okay? Is there a correlation between what you think is the top three issues and how often something appeared? Because what you might find is that if you speak to members of your family who might uh, access their news and information from other media sources, their list on what they perceive to be the biggest three issues of the last week might be different to yours because you're exposed to different media organisations who set very different agendas for you. Another example that we can look at um, happened in 1991 and it's called the Highway of Death. I'm going to show you this uh, little clip sort of that sums up um, this highway of death, which was an attack, um, and then we'll talk about it in a second. We began coming into Allied headquarters of a large Iraqi convoy far to the east. The convoy was reported to be on the highway leading out of Kuwait City. Our first concern was how do we stop the Iraqis from returning this military equipment to Iraq? So we put airplanes that night in across the highway. Pilots were ordered to stop the convoy at all costs. But that wasn't motivation enough. The commander sent the pilots into battle with the latest news report. That a missile had just hit uh, a barracks in Dahran and that 60 or so servicemen were killed. And our mission was to go up and stop the retreating forces as they left Kuwait City. And he said, put some hate in your heart, and he'll be waiting here when we get back. 
When we took off, we'd expected to see convoys leaving Kuwait City, but we weren't prepared for the magnitude, the number of vehicles that were on the ground that we saw when we broke out under the clouds. The air attack was relentless. Bombs were dropped on the front and rear of the procession, trapping the rest of the vehicles in between. The headlights all went out, but because of the reflections of the oil fires and, and the, the twilight cast by the, the low clouds, uh, I was able to still see all the vehicles on the road. I uh, could see people jumping out of vehicles, could see doors opening, could see vehicles turning off into the sand, uh, as well as those that we hit with our bombs. F-15s, B-52s, Harriers, A-6s, and A-10s, every plane available bombed the highway for two days straight. When the pilots came on scene, there were literally thousands upon thousands of vehicles stalled, empty, jammed in this giant, and they turned it into a trash heap. Pilots called the three-mile-long stretch of charred bodies and vehicles the highway of death. Initial reports were of tremendous carnage, thousands dead. And it is three miles of the most amazing vehicular carnage you can imagine. The Iraqi army didn't make a retreat at all. It was a headlong, panicky flight into disaster. I don't know what the casualty count was there. We never got one, but I would say virtually every Iraqi was in that convoy was killed. Newspapers called it a turkey shoot. Some even wondered if it was a violation of the Geneva Convention, which forbids killing an enemy clearly trying to surrender. This was an armed retreat, and when we were bombing, we were receiving constant fire. All types of anti-aircraft artillery, machine guns, and missiles were being shot at us the entire time. This was an armed retreat, not a turkey shoot. There's no doubt about it. There's a lot of destruction in war. But that's war, and that's what people have to understand. After the war, Allies counted 1,500 destroyed vehicles on that highway. Only 2% had been armored personnel carriers or tanks. The rest were Kuwaiti cars, full of loot. As for the death toll, later estimates showed it to be in the low hundreds, not thousands. At the time, however, it looked like an atrocity. And it began to develop within the White House a concern about the public relations aspect of this victory. And uh, after there were reports of a so-called highway of death, uh, General Powell and President Bush became concerned that the American uh, military not be seen as unnecessarily brutal as, quote, shooting fleeing Iraqis in the back. They wanted to avoid this perception. So the president and the general began to consider a ceasefire. The sands of Desert Storm were shifting. So we see here um, in some of that horrific footage um, two ways in which um, the agenda setting function worked. First of all, news reports were coming out of American soldiers being attacked and they were seen by um, the United States Air Force which sort of took that as, okay, if this is being reported in the news, then this is getting big. This is, this is the time of you know, the big fight in this war. And then we saw from that footage um, just how horrific it actually looked. And um, while the reality was only um, a couple of hundred people died um, in those attacks, it certainly looked like much more. And we can see and we heard about news reports saying that um, it was presented in a way that that looked much worse than what it was. Um, and that made the public question um, America's, uh, I guess, presence in Iraq. And then when the audience is getting that sort of riled up about, oh, this actually doesn't look too good, um, it actually influenced um, the politicians of the time, the United States president, to reduce military action and effectively ended the war. So we can see here how um, public perception of reality was different to reality itself, how it was presented in the media was different to reality itself, but those two things actually ended up influencing um, the politicians of the time. 
Another example, if we think of, of a more recent one, is looking at both um, Liberal Party and Labor Party um, agendas that were set in the most recent federal election. I'm not going to play these clips, but I will again include these um, in the comments below for you to just see what it was that the Labor Party tried to set as this year's uh, federal election agenda and what the Liberal Party tried to set as their um, agenda for the year. And you'll probably find if you interview or speak to um, people who voted in this election, um, depending on which party they decided to vote for, if they did vote for one of the major parties, they will probably be able to articulate to you um, the exact agenda that the Labor and Liberal Party set for the election. So some weaknesses of the agenda setting function model. Well, the first one is that while the theory um, attempts to explain how the media might shape audience opinions, it doesn't actually tell us how audience might change their behaviour because of media influence. Okay, unlike um, the hypodermic needle theory that suggested that people might engage in copycat behaviour, what they see in the media they do themselves. Um, agenda setting function just mostly talks about how people's opinions change by the media, not how their behaviour changes. A further criticism is that the theory focuses on news media, um, but it really ignores other types of media and other uses that people have for media, uh, such as those who use media for entertainment or um, social media. If I don't watch the news, then how does this model explain um, my um, relationship and the influence of media on me? Um, a further criticism stemming off this is that um, what happens in today's day and age where um, media audiences are also um, prosumers or producing content themselves through social media. Um, how can the agenda be set by um, media if I'm the one producing things and setting the agenda myself? Or how can I be influenced by media when we no longer have these great big figureheads like, um, or gatekeepers like Rupert Murdoch setting the agenda when um, most of us are now getting our media from a variety of different sources, a variety of different owners um, who create those things. Finally, um, we look at the type of data that McCombs and Shaw used. And their key study based around that uh, 1968 election used qualitative data, which we saw in reinforcement theory um, was susceptible to bias and interpretation. The other thing that McCombs and Shaw used um, was they worked out that there was a correlation between um, the agenda that the media sets and public perception of what's important. But when they said that there's a correlation or a relationship between these two things, they didn't actually say that it was a causal relationship. They didn't actually point out that the media um, agenda causes people to think that way. They just said that when one goes up, the other one goes up. So this presents a chicken or the egg dilemma where you have to question, uh, does the media putting something out influence public perception that that's important? Or does the public in talking about an issue influence the media to say that it's important and therefore they put it on the front page of the newspaper? So it doesn't quite explain which one comes first. So if you need a little bit more information on the agenda setting function theory of media communication, Please read pages 235 to 236 of your Heinemann Media textbook and complete learning activities 1, 3 and 4 that correspond to this section. 
As always, if you feel like you need to go over any of these things, please feel free to um, replay this video. Um, make comments if you've got questions down below. Um, and pause and use this video to help you in revision. Thank you for your attention and I'll see you in the next video.